Coming up on this episode of Belief Hole. It's a warm summer night. You're all alone in the orange grove and decide to take advantage of the solitude by diving into the still waters of a strangely placed swimming pool. All is peaceful until you begin to feel that something's wrong. There's an ominous brooding in the air and you feel as though you're being watched. You shake it off and tell yourself it's your imagination. After all, you're all alone, swimming in the dark. But when you push off from the slick cement, something grabs you by the ankle. From roadside hyena monstrosities to occult rituals in the Redlands. On this episode of Belief Hole, we tread the dark, back country of the bazaar to bring you true and terrifying tales of the inexplicable and the unknown. Synchronicity, Sasquatch, Homunculus, Alien Races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Close like, the door, in. Jeremy. It close is. your door. What's the uh, inner Earth disagreements? Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman, Bohemian Grove, Corey Feldman, Magicians are demons, Specters, and Spirit spooks. Summonings, Sleep Strange Disappearances, Sky Whale Phenomena, yes. Alternative History, Shadow People. Shh, quiet, I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. And Naki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf Towers. I would never talk about it. That's old. Y2K. Cover ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Vampire. Well, hello, hello. Hello. Hi. We are back from our mid-season break and it feels good in the hole. Feels so good to be back. Wow. I'm John. I'm Chris. And I'm Jeremy. And we are the brothers of the belief hole here to dance for you. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see it, but we're dancing. Well, welcome. Welcome to be here. Yes, indeed. Feels good to be back. No, it really does. But we got a great show for you today. Yes, we do. Oh, yes. My favorite kind of show. I don't know. Is this your guys' favorite kind of show? It's always mine. Strange Listener Stories. 15. <laughs> These are my favorite. It's definitely fun to be able to connect with the listeners. Get original stories. Yeah, and also it just brings my mind back to times of sitting around a campfire, you know. Mm-hmm. We're at a party with the random uncle and he's like, you know, One time, I don't tell the story much. You know, that sort of thing, though. Yeah, or you're at a bar and you hear, like, some old sailor behind you. In the fishing village, you have to be hanging out and just telling a tale (laughs) of an octopus monster who had a treasure buried at the bottom of the sea. I'm sure everyone can relate to that listening. No, I like the vibe. I like the feeling. And I'm excited for this one, Chris. This is going to be interesting because this is the first time, in a long time at least, that I can remember, where I have no idea what stories you're bringing. Yeah. I'm focused on the expansion this time, and you are doing the main episode of the listener stories. Yes. You've curated quite a collection, though. Well, let me give you a a quick word preview. Tease it up. Of what's coming. (laughs) Today, we've got grinning, braid-pulling doppelgangers. Let's wrap your mind around that. Braid-pulling? Braid-pulling. We've got beckoning lights of fire. We have occult rituals in the Redlands. That's going to be interesting. Oh, interesting. Uh, And bipedal highway hyenas. And a lot more. That's a lot of imagery that's randomly flashing in my head now. It'll be fun trying to sound design that. (laughs) That'll be interesting. Bipedal what? Bipedal highway hyenas. Weird. Yeah. That sounds Actually, we're going to start with that tale. Ooh, uh, good. There's actually more juice to this than I realized as far as contextual information. A little cooperation. Contextual juice. Contextual <laughs> juice. <laughs> we should sell that in the merch store. <laughs> Bottles of context juice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so thank you to everyone who's been submitting stories. Keep them coming. Yeah, we've got uh, a lot. So we'll never get through all of them on the actual show, but we also have an archive that we're building. There's a real possibility that it could turn into something else, yeah. like a book at some point mm-hmm. or maybe even another channel. Yeah. So just because you haven't heard it, doesn't mean that at some point it won't get out into the world. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, we're looking at ways to get more of the stories told. So yeah, we'll keep you informed. But uh, just buckle up for today. 
buckle up your little um, spooky buckle. <laughs> Sorry. Your <laughs> spooky buckle. You've been out of the studio for a bit. <laughs> Get your spooky buckle on. <laughs> but no, I picked some of my favorites from the um, archive that we've been gathering. So are you guys ready? Without further ado, we can yeah, just jump just right dive in. in. Let's get in. Let's do it. Oh, I did want to say, since we are back and we are saying hello to you, all of you listeners, we're not going to get into it, but there's a lot of news that happened, obviously, over the break. We had the fall of the Georgia Guidestones, mm-hmm. which was pretty crazy. If you're interested in hearing our thoughts on that, you can sign up to be a member. We did cover that in our live stream, members only live stream That's right. that we did during the break. So if you're interested in that and just other things, you can sign up to be a member for minimum five fifty a month and uh, get access to that and all the kinds of other craziness expansion episodes but anyways two more things hit the like button attention all youtubers please hit the like button or we will be forced to explode your face and if you guys are signing off too early sometimes we leave little gems of sonic hilarity at the end of the show the outtakes yeah just remember that you might be missing something towards the end yeah check it out all right let's get into it all right let's get into the darkness This first story is a classic account of something strange on the roadside. One of my favorite genres. Spooky tale. Roadside weirdies. Sure. Sleepy creepies. So this story comes to us from Tavis, and this occurred in Indiana in 1991. I call this Dog Monster in the Road. In 1991, when I was about six years old, my mother and myself were driving down the road when suddenly, off the side of the road, a very large dog walked out in front of us. Now this dog was like mastiff size, but its body was oddly shaped. It was big in the chest and skinny in the back. It looked like a hyena. It walked out in front of our car. As it got into the middle of the road, it looked our way, stopped and stood up on its back legs facing us. My mother and I screamed as we slammed into the creature. As a six-year-old, I was frozen. My eyes had locked onto this thing after we hit it. It rolled like a fur tumbleweed down the road in front of us, melted into the road and vanished. My mom was also horrified and screamed, What the hell was that? As she sped off in a frenzy, driving toward her friend's house. When we arrived, She had her boyfriend come outside and look at her car while she frantically recalled the encounter. We discovered a dent in the bumper and one of the headlights had been busted out. After my mom finished recalling the events, the boyfriend, my mom and myself all loaded up and drove back to the scene to try and find this creature. But obviously nothing was found. To this day, my mom still recalls this event. So I know it wasn't a dream or false memory. She says, quote, I still don't know what that was nor do I want to know, but it wasn't a dog. Creepy. That is creepy. I mean, obviously a very fantastical story. Standing on the high Especially the melting part. Yeah. That is a creepy description. Yeah. I like that he said it rolled like a fur tumbleweed down the road in front of us and then melted into the road and vanished. I mean, that's supernatural. Yeah. I mean. It's not just like an animal. If if he's being literal there, like it seemed to melt into the road and vanish, then that's definitely something. Yeah. At first I really, I was like, is this like a, like a metaphor, but melting into the road, Mm -hmm. I don't know what that, unless like visually, like in the distance, maybe. I'm going to assume that they literally meant that. They saw it like boil and. No, it just probably like just vanished into the road, like some trans-dimensional being or something. Mm -hmm. That's most Either way, I mean, you already have the, the high strangeness of it standing up on its back legs. And also the description of it looking more like a hyena mm-hmm. than anything else. I mean, this is in Indiana. Yeah, a couple of thoughts. The Elkhorn, Indiana, I believe it was, where you had the Beast of Bray Road. Oh, yeah. So you have bipedal dog-like creatures. The back legs thing, if it's a short amount of time, obviously animals do occasionally stand on their back legs and do a little walk around, a little jig. It's just weird to come out in the road to see you go, oh. And stand oh. up on it. And then it's so it stood up after seeing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of dogman encounters, you get that where they're first on all fours. And you're like, that is a gigantic either bear or wolf. And then it stands yeah. up. But I, I want to see one of those in, in my lifetime. With all the research we've done. Say that. Yeah, you now. say that now. I want to until the point that I see it. But until I see it, I will want Look, to. Wait, wait, take it back. Take it back. <laughs> I'll be haunted for the rest of my life. But, you know, when you haven't had that experience yet, 
I will always be naive to that, the real terror, until it actually happens. Oh, yeah, for So sure. I'll continue wishing for it until, <laughs> you know, from the safety of my car. Well, Jeremy was right. never heard from again. Jeremy just gives up the show. He doesn't say why and just moves into Nebraska and never speaks to anyone he again. moves into the city. Yeah, I move into the city. Even though there are some dogman encounters some behind some Burger Kings and back alleys. So you, we did cover one of those. can't really yeah. get away, but I... You can't really get away <laughs> from the dog, man. I feel like, uh, we probably talked about this on the show, but there's a certain point you get to where you've researched so much stuff, you told so many stories, and you start to get jaded, you yeah. know? Because I came into this show, like, hyped on dog, man. I would tell every Starbucks barista, absolutely. And I still believe in that there is something out there. You know, I can't say for sure, but I believe people that have told the stories. I've seen enough, heard enough. And doing historical research on the sinus cephali, there's a practical argument for there being something out there. But the more you look at something and never get to see it yourself. Well, you don't really do a whole lot of looking, to be fair. Yeah, yeah, not out in the wild. I don't think you can. I don't think anyone's going to find it by going out and hunting for the dog man. I think it's just one of those things that people in the right place, right time. Right, that's true. But I mean, you could try harder. (laughs) <laughs> I, I'm, I don't, I just don't believe that I could, I could track one yeah, down. I, I mean, my point is just spend to spend like, a couple nights in the woods of Silver Creek. That's yeah. That's not very big though. You couldn't do it. Oh, I could do it. No, you couldn't. Oh, I could do it. Could you do it for $5,000? Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'll do it for $50. Is that a, no, wait, you won't. That's Chris. on the record. That's on the you record. You get scared from the, like for your fan noise. I'm also poor. And <laughs> one way outweighs the other. No. I'm a whore for horror. Anyways. I'm a whore for horror. <laughs> Zinga. No, I, I only brought that up just to say that I'm to that point where, you know, I'm just, I'm so starved to feel the passion brew again. I mm-hmm. need some kind you of experience. Well, take it from the mom in the story. Cause th- I think that's kind of the point is to this day, she still says, I still don't know what it was, but I know for sure it was not a dog. So according to her, there are strange things out there, Jeremy, on their back legs walking around Even with Even on the basic cryptozoological level, you have reports of American hyenas. Yes. Let's get into that because I did not know this really until this episode, until American his story. American hyena in London. Yes. Yes. That's the sequel to. <laughs> <laughs> American werewolf. Or what uh, is it? American werewolf in Paris? American werewolf in London was the original. And That's then right. And Paris was the one when we were growing up. Oh, okay. Where Bush was on the soundtrack. Yes. You gave me this. I love we, we was like both of our immediate most prioritized memory of that movie is Bush being involved in the. It was a good song. It was a good movie. I don't know if it holds up. No, I don't think the CG does. Let's move along. Sorry. Okay, but this is what I thought was interesting. I had not heard of this hyena sightings in North America, and also I'm not going to get deep into this because I want to move on through the stories. But there was also a species or a, a genus of hyena that in the Pliocene roamed North America. So some people argued that it's still here, just like dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. Like the raptors in the Southwest, uh, what, baby T-Rexes? Mm-hmm. Did we ever cover those? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Moving along. Um, sorry, <laughs> I know we have a lot of good stories you want to get to. I don't mean to hold it up. That's okay. This one specifically, there's an interesting native tradition among the Iowa tribe. And they're in the Mississippi River Valley area, Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, where Jim will move after he sees a dog man. Um, <laughs> not a safe place. What they refer to, something that sounds a lot like this, they called it Shunka Wa Rekin. Which means carries off dog. Ooh. Yes. So this is something that's been reported. It's big enough to grab a dog and run off with. It's like a wolf. Yeah. The jaws are supposed to be very yeah, powerful. than a wolf. Yeah. Well, it could be a carry off a very like large a pug. Wolf. Yeah, but. But like if you're going average dog, average other thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you're saying. Think it could carry Jake off? A dire wolf yeah. could. A dire wolf could. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That would be horrifying. Yes. These things sound pretty horrifying. The description of these. So massive jaws. But again, it sounds like hyena-like with the long front legs compared to the rear, which are short, right? What a silly design. <laughs> oh, the legs? Yeah. Yeah. It, it does just, look silly. It's just a little silly. Well, it's kind of, it looks like he's always primed on his back legs to like ready to, It looks you know. like a decrepit being. Yeah, we have a picture in the show notes, guys. So yes, looks looked like a hyena. They described this thing and apparently had also been sighted by white settlers that had moved into these areas. Some settlers even claiming that they had mounted specimens that they caught and shot. And there's one specific famous example, and that's what this picture is. I remember this. Oh, you, you've heard of this? Oh yeah, I looked into this for another episode a while back. Well, you know, some people relate this to the Wahila. The, what is the... Mm-hmm. Um, that's what it was in reference to, which is Nahani Valley legend, right? right? Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, the specific famous example, this specimen was allegedly shot in Montana in 1886 by a man named Israel Aman Hutchins. And John, that's this picture over here. And this is the comparison of, of the specimen that he shot with a hyena. So there's kind of a back-to-back. You can kind of see the similarities. It's like, definitely close. Very close, right? I think the legs look shorter in the back. Yeah, yeah the, they almost look even shorter than a hyena's legs in the back. They do. It's Very, like a little pig. 
Yeah, it does have like kind of a stout pig body, yeah. like a hairy If you boar. look at the face, which I don't have in this note, but I'll have it in the show notes, it almost looks like a bear's face in a way. It's broad. It's almost diamond-shaped broad. But very interesting, they, they've never been able to identify what this specimen was that was caught. And it's still in the museum, I believe. It was acquired after Hutchins shot it. It was acquired by a taxidermist named Joseph Sherwood, and he displayed it in the general store in Idaho, and he named this species Ringdacus. <laughs> And uh, it's never been formally examined, or some people say it has, but we've never heard the results of the examination. Either way, there's no public information on what DNA tests have said mm -hmm. about this creature, so we still don't know what it is. Some people say maybe it's because the museum knows that it's not really something that anomalous, so they just don't want to share. Where was this again that this was discovered? This was shot in Montana. Okay. The story we told from our listeners in Indiana, but things like this are cited all over the country. Is this American hyena phenomenon I've never heard of. But again, goes back to the Pliocene, or could go back to the yeah. Pliocene. Interesting. I remember doing research on that, the Wahila. Was that what it was connected to? Well, some people compare it to that. Right. I remember reading a pretty good argument for why that didn't. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't look quite the same to me. So this could be some kind of American hyena or something that people would call that, that people have been seeing. Mm -hmm. Then that's maybe what Tavis saw, potentially. Or it could have been, a, you know, or someone's going to say skinwalker because there's always someone in the crowd with the hand raised <laughs> right. skinwalker because it's an unidentified kind of canid type. But an interesting but. tale for sure and one that led to an interesting observation about something I'd never heard of, the American hyena. Thank you for that story, Tavis. Yes, thank you very much. And to your mother. Word to your mother. <laughs> but shall we move on to the next story? Yes. Very interesting. John, I'm going to have you read this one because you read this and responded to the writer. V. This is called Call of the Firelights. Yes, from Anonymous, and this occurred in Manila, Philippines in the early 1990s. My first paranormal, supernatural, or unexplained experience was when I was about six to seven years old in our old house in the Philippines. It was a very long time ago, so of course my memory could be messing with me but I have always constantly thought about this encounter my whole life. It was so weird that I never told anyone about it. I might have mentioned it in passing and in a lighthearted way during those conversations I used to have with friends back in college or something over drinks, when the topic of conversation started leaning into the unknown or high strangeness, but I really do not recall ever telling anyone about it and sharing it like a real memory. It was just so obscure and strange that I have kept it in the dark recesses of my mind, but I get to conjure it up once in a while when I listen to people talk about their experiences, mostly through podcasts like yours. One night after dinner, maybe around 7 p.m., everyone was inside the house and I was outside in our garage. In the Philippines, the garage is usually in the front of the house and is a part of your front lawn area near the front door and houses are usually barricaded by a gate. So I was just a little outside our front door, which was left open, and I was probably playing in my dad's car, which I loved to do as a kid, pretending to drive. All of a sudden, I had this unexplainable feeling of being called or beckoned outside the house. I walked towards our gate, and I looked up at the sky and saw an orange hue glimmering between the trees in a vacant lot in front of our house. I had no idea what it was, but I also didn't really care because I was a kid and it could have been a lamppost in another street that is shining through. I don't really know, but I remember the feeling very vividly. It made me excited and almost gave me a feeling of longing, like something or someone was telepathically sending me positive messages, love, gentleness, etc., but also making me want to go out there which also confused me and made me wary. So I didn't go outside the gate. I remember staring at this orange light and the objects surrounding it with awe and curiosity for a while until I heard my older cousin, who used to babysit my siblings and me, call me to go back inside the house. It's getting dark, sweetie. Time to come inside. I didn't think anything of it and continued playing inside until bedtime. The weirder thing happened later that evening, in the middle of the night. I remember waking up from my sleep because I thought it was daytime. It was like when someone turns on the light switch while you're trying to nap, and the sudden light in the room comes through your eyelids as dark orange when your eyes are still closed. 
I opened my eyes and I saw two red orange fireballs swimming across my room. I say swimming because they were moving like fish swimming in an aquarium, just very gently in a straight line, but also wobbling once in a while and turning around to avoid hitting the walls. They were a few inches away from the ceiling, just moving horizontally in front of me, and there was another very strange aspect to it that I would never forget. They looked like static almost, like grainy and pixelated, as if I was watching them through a VHS camcorder. I looked at my cousin who was in another bed close to me, and she was sleeping like a log. I sat up on my bed and stared at these two fireballs, and I remember the room glowing with orange light and thought it looked so cozy, I was mesmerized. I thought, okay, this must be a dream. So I started pinching myself and slapping my face, a thing I'd seen people do in movies. I tried calling out to my cousin, but I also didn't want anyone to scare away these gentle fireballs, whatever they were. So I really didn't mind that she was sleeping through this. This was weird because every time I look back at this memory, I tell myself, I should have been scared. But honestly, when it was happening, I was not scared or even bothered at all. It felt natural and not supernatural. I watched the mysterious orange lights for a while, maybe less than an hour. Then they started to move towards the window and just pass through the screen, the metals, etc. Like it was colored, dusty air. And my room was dark again. I have had maybe two to three high strangeness events happen to me, but I'm really usually a logical, science can explain this soon enough type of person, so I don't think much of them. Not true, I think a lot of them, but do not share them, even with my close friends, till recently because I worked on my self-confidence. But when they happen, I go back to reading and listening to stuff like your show, just to feel like I am not alone. I never told my family about it seriously, and like I said, I have talked about it in jest. But I know deep inside my heart that whatever that event or show was, was something especially for me. You are not alone, V. That's a cool story. Yeah. Really interesting. Interesting story and so familiar in a lot of ways to stories we've talked about in the past. We had a listener story before, if you guys remember, with the nighttime orange orb appearing in someone's room and they had interaction with it. Mm -hmm. That stuff's pretty common. John, I think, and you mentioned this in your response to this listener, what you found really fascinating was that it was almost like it was beckoning you with a feeling of longing, Mm -hmm. like a homesickness sort of feeling. It reminds me a lot of the near-death experiences. Like, I just don't think this is our home. You know, Mm -hmm. I think that we come from somewhere else. And what if it was a spaceship? You know, I think that all possibilities are open as far as like this, if this isn't our home and, you know, there's infinite galaxies out there, like we're, we're all just star travelers. Uh huh. <laughs> and that longing feeling, maybe they're just paying a visit to say hi. And, you know, when there's like an emotional connection, mm-hmm. I think it kind of can remind some people of like, oh, yeah, like that's where we all came yeah. from, sort mm-hmm. of feeling. John is a star seed, in case you guys didn't know. <laughs> I am. He's seeded from the stars. I came here to awaken people. <laughs> <laughs> Very believable in that voice. And this was a positive encounter. Yeah. I was going to say, though, uh, if you look at it from a more pessimistic point of view, this very much reminds me of fairy lore. Well, you that I was, but I was going to say strange voices or um, disembodied voices. Disembodied voices, like Tim Marchenko's book, Disembodied Voices, where he talks about that. He talks about the lure, where something is calling you to come outside, luring you, luring you to come out into the trap. Great book, by the way. Check it out. Oh, disembodied yeah. voices. Absolutely. Link in the show notes. Yeah, but it showed up in his bedroom. Right later. Yeah. Or hers. It's anonymous, right? They signed it's it. True, it's, yeah. it v? it's V, but it's female. I know. I know the person's a female. Okay. I mean, if it was negative. There was no intent right. to harm. harm. Yeah. It was there for an hour just giving off love. Right. Love you're, vibes. Yeah, you're right. It also reminds me of, do you guys remember the story we covered of the woman who called into Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell, where she had that mouse, like she felt compelled yeah. to go again, go outside. And there was a little mouse creature there that she talked to and then she passed oh, yeah. out and missed dinner. She missed, had missing time. That was an interesting story. That was like story. as a child too. Yeah. Something to do with children too. They're just more open to this mm-hmm. stuff. There could be also that, because yeah, we have the imposter entities, we have the extraterrestrial, allegedly, or some kind of craft abduction where people feel lured and peaceful and then they're abducted mm-hmm. and people have positive or negative experiences after that. This seems like an all the way through a positive kind of experience, but the yeah. very practical appearance of this sounds like, I think it's Ignis Fautis, right? Ghost lights, fire lights, 
that's a common thing seen over swamps. It's, it's like glitchy though. That's what's different because I was going to say static. Specifically in the Philippines, Philippine folklore, there is San Telmo, which I, maybe that comes from San Telmo's fire. Probably. But there's specifically a, a Philippine version of this. Maybe we'll have that linked in the show. So you guys are interesting. Definitely not ball lightning because that's pretty quick. No. It's out of the room. Also doesn't give you feelings yeah, of for an hour. Love. It does remind me, uh, This it's not really related, but it kind of reminds me of that weird red hand. Yes, uh, from Simon Van Elg. And well, again, it's another yeah. nighttime visitation of something that is... Right. And that one, was, I think, was kind of staticky too, but it was another red element. It was like other dimensional, yeah. Yeah. Who was the... What was her name? I just emailed her recently, but she had a follow-up to her porcelain mask story. Right. Oh, yeah, Tanya. Tanya, yeah. Remember that? She woke up in her bedroom. Oh, right. Another nighttime visitation. Yeah. The porcelain mask that came up to her. Was, it was just like right in her face. And as it backed away, she realized there was nothing behind it. Yeah. If you guys are new to the show and you haven't heard these really fascinating stories, go back and listen to our Strange Listener Stories episodes from listeners like you. Yeah. We have 15 of them. Very yeah. interesting. 15 episodes, which each have like, I don't know. Thousands of stories in <laughs> Thousands. total. Thousands. <laughs> Thank you for that story, V. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool story. I, lo- I love stories like that. They're just weird. And I kind of like sometimes when they're not super spooky, but they're just like magical. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And again, I thought a really interesting thing about this too. The description in that story where she said, and it was turning around to avoid hitting the walls. So it's definitely yeah. something in the it room. It reminds me of a Roomba. Oh, avoiding the, the <laughs> boundaries. It reminds me of a dream I would have after playing a lot of like Super Mario when I was a kid. Like those kind of pixelated fireballs or it sounds video, video right. game Yeah, where you like turn and look the other yeah, way. Yeah, and it's and like moving, you just got to time stops. it out to jump past, you know? Yeah. But just so weird. It is a very unique description. Yeah. If any of you out there have seen any VHS style pixelated phenomena, fireballs, fireballs right let us know. It also, reminded me of, remember the la- on the last episode, the last Strange Listener Stories uh-huh. episode, we we had that Aqua Visitor story. Yes, I called it. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that it definitely was like mm-hmm. that similar one. to that as well. This is this is definitely a category of stories that we get from time to time. Something at night that is seems ethereal, colored, bright bedtime visitors. Yeah, yeah. Jeremy, do you want to take on the next story? We have a lot of uh, unique accounts in this episode. And this one is definitely fascinating. I call it the river at dawn. Oh, I love this one. This one has been submitted by Danny Turpin, and she's from Dayton, Ohio. Oh. This occurred in 2018. Did this happen in Ohio? Yes. Oh. Maybe we should have a little road trip. It could. Or maybe not, depending on how freaky this is. <clears throat> okay. River at dawn. Hello there. My name is Danny, and I'm from Dayton, Ohio. And I have a story that I think will really give you guys the chills. But first I need to give you a little setup. My whole life has been heavily affected by the paranormal and just weird creepy happenings in general. From the time I was born to even now, it's just always been that way, even for other members of my family. Starting around the age of 13, things started to get super aggressive in my parents' house. And once I transitioned to high school and then college, the activity became darker. I began hearing my name whispered from certain parts of the house or corners from my room at night while trying to sleep. On two occasions, I felt a large unseen force get into bed with me. The house grew to have a dark, uneasy, and unwelcoming feeling. It was now specifically affecting my sleep. Because of these things happening, I pretty much stopped sleeping altogether and would lay awake for hours into the morning, waiting for daylight so I could leave the house and go to school or do whatever, as long as it meant getting out of that house. I was going to art school at the time and would need to be in class by 8 a.m. But because I wasn't sleeping, I started getting up around 5 a.m. to drive down to the river in my hometown and sit on this little bench that's been there for years. I would sit there and watch the sun come up It became a nice morning ritual that I got to look forward to in my nightmare of a life at the time. This was a crisp fall morning. I remember it was incredibly foggy and it had that Halloween atmosphere to the air. Diagonal from this bench, I'd say about 10-ish feet away, is this giant concrete block, which I assume covers water pipes or something having to do with the river. But it's something I used to lay on when I was young and look up at the sky from. As I'm sitting on this bench, It's completely quiet, totally devoid of any noise, except for the soft sounds of water gently moving in the river. The sun was gonna be coming up in about 30 minutes when I suddenly started to feel uncomfortable. I felt like I was being watched or that someone was going to come up behind me. I felt 
paranoid. Like the feelings I'd get at my parents' house before something weird happened. And then I heard it. It sounded like something or someone was on the other side of that giant block, breaking sticks in half. Then all of a sudden, I saw the blacked out, misshapen shadow of a figure step out from behind the block. Once it stepped out, only everything from the waist up was visible. It stretched out one long arm around that covered two sides of this block. Something that would be totally impossible if this were a human, because this block was very large with wide sides. It almost looked like a cartoon by how long and stretchy the arms looked, and I was frozen in fear. I wanted to run so bad, but I physically couldn't get my legs to start moving. This thing started to shimmy up this concrete cinder block like a spider monkey. My GTFO kicked in, and I stood up and literally started speed running to my car that was parked just under the only visible street light, which was looking like my savior at the moment. I didn't look back until I slammed my body into my driver's seat, locked my doors, and turned on my high beams. I kept thinking I was gonna see that thing, slithering down through the fog, off the ramp hill onto the street, and come for me. I was so scared when I got the courage to run that I left my coffee sitting at the bench that morning. I took off in my car, and for some reason, had tears running down my face. I think because of the fear. I skipped going to the river the rest of the week, and ended up waiting until the following Monday. And when I pulled up and got myself ready to confront that cinder block again, it just looked darker than usual. And I said, nope, and backed out and just drove around until class started. I'd never gone back to watch the early morning sunrise. Crazy. Yeah. Thank you, Danny, for that story. It's so visual. Yeah. I could just see that being there. It reminds me of the, you know, our hometown canal fault in the Tuscarawas River. There's, you know, benches certain spots you kind of near the wood line and they have those giant i always call them pennywise tubes yeah they're like sewer blocks they're like yeah i think yeah. they're for flooding the river like ladders you can go down and i just yeah. watched it oh did you yeah <laughs> did you watch that before every <laughs> I feel episode? like you watch it every day <laughs> no i've never seen it okie dokie <laughs> <laughs> no i just i watched it in the netflix movie theater on the on the oculus oh, on the vr i only got like halfway through too was, scary no i just oh. fell asleep <laughs> the beginning scene is awesome like I loved it, how they made it so much more graphic than the original. It's like shocking. Yeah. Do you oh yeah. Scene? I did not like it. It bothered me. It, so, he like bites his arm. Yeah. And it's just like yeah, <sighs> super intense. Rips his arm off, and the kid has like one arm. And he's trying to get away. Kind of a weird synchronicity right there. The the hand, the stretchy arm coming out of that sewer. It was one of those big cement column things right by the river. Yeah. It was, and it was a stretchy arm. So it just reminded me of oh, that weird. scene. That is creepy. Yeah. I was just going to say, the arm just reminds me of a shadow entity, some kind of creature made of just darkness, empty space, which reminds me of, you know, the shadow person or the hat man, that kind of idea. Right. But being outside is interesting. And yeah. by the water, every time there's something by the water, it always just triggers that idea of the water being some kind of, oh, John, you had a good word for this Conduit? in the past. One time we were talking about the concept of the water being some kind of medium for trans-dimensional passage between the Transducer, world and the I think John said. You said something that I thought was a good word for it. Huh. I had a good idea one time. You were impressed by it, John. I, I was had impressed. a good idea at one point. But yes, that so that was definitely an interesting story. Yeah, thank you, Danny. That was that was pretty great. Just fascinating too. It sounds like the strange happenings, whatever was haunting her and her family at that house. I mean, very likely seems followed her there or appeared there somehow because she was having so many. Or maybe she's just sensitive to these things. She said these things did affect her and her father more. So maybe there's something about. Did them. she have more insight on another paranormal experience she was having? Yes, and actually, I have one more account from her that I really want to share on this episode because it is. So fantastic. So this next account is another one from Danny. And I'm usually I break stories up from people into different episodes, but because there's two people actually that are featured in this episode where their stories are so connected that it was hard to separate them out. This this is another one from Danny. Again, during her haunting experiences in Dayton, Ohio. A lot of things happened in this house. So this happened in Dayton, Ohio in 2019. And this one I called Braid Puller. In 2019, my boyfriend and I were living in this historic old house that was around 150 years old in downtown Dayton. One night, we were sleeping when I woke up out of a nightmare and was instantly stuck in sleep paralysis. I've been having SP since middle school, and I'm 28 now, so it's something I'm very used to. So I just tried to relax until it wore off, 
or until I fell back asleep. Across from our bed, we had a huge floor-standing mirror leaning against our wall. And the way it sat, you could see us, our bed, and the whole back side of our bedroom. As I'm laying there, totally unable to move, I started to hear shuffling in our room. I began to panic and was trying to move my hand to touch my boyfriend to wake him up, but that didn't work. Then I saw a blurry figure walking back and forth inside the reflection of the mirror. It would only go as far as the full width the mirror would allow. Back and forth, back and forth. Then this figure, who I then realize is a total copy of me, shuffled out of the mirror and was now standing inside our room. That's terrifying. Yeah. I was laying there stuck, following this thing with my eyes, as this thing that looked like me crawled around the floor of our room. Circling our bed, I was petrified, beyond comprehension. All of a sudden, my viewpoint changed, and I was able to see myself from up above, almost like I was in an OBE, viewing the experience from the ceiling. I saw this thing, which was wearing the same thing I went to bed in, and even had its hair braided with a single braid down the back like I had. It was smiling from ear to ear, like a creepy maniac crouched behind the bed. It took its hands with long fingers and wrapped them around my braid and started to pull back. I could see myself lift up and see my neck being strained and could even feel it from up above. This thing was trying to pull me off my bed with my braided hair and it was just smiling and looking up at me the whole time. I saw my mouth open as if I was trying to scream, but it was like the sound was sucked out of the room. Suddenly, I burst out of SP and my viewpoint was back to normal. I looked around the room and didn't see anything, but I still felt as if I was being watched. It just didn't feel right in that room, so I snuggled in close to my boyfriend until sunrise. The next day, I didn't tell him what happened because I just needed to let it go and not bring it up. As I'm standing in our kitchen cutting up veggies for lunch, still with my hair and a long braid down my back, my boyfriend walks in and comes behind me and out of nowhere grabs my braid and pulls it back with his hands. I screamed. And he kind of jumped back, shocked that I reacted that way. It felt so similar to what I had experienced hours before. I kept asking him why he did that, what made him pull it like that. He said he didn't know. He said he just wanted to. I started to get emotional and ended up explaining what had happened the night before. He then proceeds to tell me that I was whispering weird muffled words under my breath as I slept. He was obviously freaked out and said he didn't want to talk about it anymore. Creepy. Yeah. yeah. That's really weird. Mm -hmm. I mean, was he like pushed to do it? Not possessed, but like somehow triggered. Triggered, yeah. Uh, Maybe he picked up somehow on her experience, even though he wasn't the one having how it. how powerful yeah. the creature being was. I mean... Creature being. Obviously, the skeptical the initial thought would be, well, a dream, right? Just a terrifying... Like a sleep, sleep paralysis sleep hallucination. Sleep paralysis. But not in the whole. It's weird, too, the way that she describes it. You know, you think about doppelgangers and you think about astral entities, things just outside that we can sometimes see when having an out-of-body experience or an astral right. projection. It's interesting too to think that if she saw this thing, was she, when she was in sleep paralysis, was she in that hypnagogic state where you can maybe sometimes see faces or things that you can't normally see in this reality if that's what's really happening? But then when this thing comes out and starts threatening her, it's almost like her consciousness was like, I'm out of here right. as a protective measure and then popped out into yeah. an OBE experience where she could be, her consciousness could be protected from that. At the same time, was this thing trying to get into her body yeah. to possess her. And then that would leave her a vessel at that point, which is freaky. And then, but her boyfriend's laying there, could potentially this thing have impacted him in some way, obviously. Well, it made him want to pull the brain. It's braid. interesting too. And I think the OBE is a very specific aspect to this account that you can connect to other experiences, obviously with sleep paralysis. Uh, you have sleep paralysis being a big aspect to the out-of-body experience. My experience was, was like that. And exactly right. Like we hear stories about things from somewhere else trying to take over people. That's one of the things that I thought of when I was reading this, this account. This thing looks like her, is coming towards her, pulling her off the bed. Is it trying to get into her while she's out of her body? 
that's another creepy aspect to the story that I think is fascinating to consider. Was there a purpose of possession right. in this an intent. case? And again, like, you know, of course, as you mentioned earlier, the skeptical concepts will be related to, you know, a dream. Could this possibly be a, a, just a simple dream or a sleep paralysis hallucination? But I think especially if you couple this with all the other phenomena she's experienced unrelated to sleep paralysis in her home that her father's experienced, other members of her family, uh, it makes it a lot more believable that there was something real going on in this experience. What if there's a connection to the black armed thing at the river? Exactly. Sorry, Danny. I hope that uh, you're not being haunted by these things. So these things are still going on. Okay. So we might get some more <laughs> accounts down the road, but yeah. definitely interesting. Just stay safe out there in the land of the strange. Do you guys want to take a quick break? Yeah. Cool. So yes, but before we go to break, Jeremy, why don't you fill us in on what is going on for the expansion? Oh, the expansion. Yes. For those of you who are expansion members and those of you who are about to sign up to be, get ready. Because if you heard our Nahani Valley episode, classic, and enjoyed the dark mystery of the Great White North, well, you're in for a treat because we are going to be exploring the mystery and the terror of Portlock, Alaska. Basically, if you guys don't know what it is, a quick breakdown of what we're going to be getting into is the legend, the town that exists there now, in the way it exists, is a ghost town. And there's all kinds of mystery and lore that we're going to be digging into. But the basic idea, Portlock, or Port Chatham, in Chatham Bay, Alaska, there was a small fishing cannery there, which later became a large fishing cannery. Anyways, there were people that were working there, fishermen, loggers, miners. There was a chromium mine in the area. So there was a small kind of village that was growing. It was starting to become a pretty established town from all accounts. But then suddenly, throughout a span of a couple decades, really, if you want to start at the 1930s going up to the 1940s, there was reportedly a series of attacks, murders, allegedly by something, some unknown force in the wilderness. Now the native people there have a legend about a beast or a creature, a spirit even, phantom-like, depending on how you want to interpret it. And we're going to get into all the details and nitty-gritty of the interpretations of the lore, but it is known as the Nantinok, which a lot of people say, well, it's a Bigfoot. That's how they would describe it. But there's some phantom-like supernatural aspects to this thing. So we'll get into that, the history, the derivation, uh, how it connects to Nahani, actually, even though it's not right in the same area, it's still up upper Northwest, North American continent. Just a really interesting atmosphere, really fascinating story of why all these people just abandoned this town over this time period where there were these disappearances, mysterious deaths. Reportedly, we'll get into the skepticism, the fact, the fiction, and the true mystery of how this town became abandoned and by what unnatural forces. Awesome. Sounds awesome, man. Yeah, it'll be fun. So sign up, guys. Sign up for the expansion and we will regale you with the mystery. Check out Ruddy Man, too. We can play a little commercial, too, but... Oh, yeah. Ruddy Man Groom, if you guys got beards, get this We've get got this really good responses from people that have checked it out. So if you got a beard, you got someone you love that has a beard, now is the time. Excellent. Yes. Absolutely. Head on over to Believful.com. Take care of it. Yeah, you'll hear that, and you'll hear an expansion clip of this episode for a preview. So sign up, and if you have a beard, buy the beard products. Yes, as, Gosh, an, darn it. as an expansion member, <laughs> double the episodes. Just keep that in mind. It's worth it. Every single person that signs up says it's life changing. That's true. Every <laughs> single one. It literally makes every second of their day better. Mm -hmm. It stays with them for so long. It haunts them, really. Because it's so good. You're just wasting your time if you're not a part of it. Get in there and save your life. All right, we'll be back. Access granted. Melania Helen Kell, Nan Wallach's eldest resident, is frequently called upon around the village to impart her memories of how life used to be on this southernmost tip of the Kenai Peninsula. Among her remembrances are medicines used to heal the sick and ways of preserving sea lion meat in barrels for winter. She also is one of the last to tell the ghostly story of how the village of Port Chatham came to be deserted, why the abandoned town was shunned, and those who once lived there vowed to never return. Melania was born January 25th, 1934, at Port Chatham, then a small village founded at the edge of a peaceful moorage. But when Melania was a baby, the family abruptly moved away from Chatham, leaving the house and every board of its frame behind. What frightening situation caused John and Helen Romanoff to take their children and flee to Nanwilik? We left our houses in the school and started all new here. 
Melania said in a recent interview, speaking in her traditional Sukstun through translator Sally Ash. Now, that name's important, Sally. Keep that in mind, her translator. There was plentiful land here for gardening and people. My parents built a house on the beach. What had frightened Melania's parents hadn't been a single event. Over a long period of time, a Nantanuk, our big hairy creature, was reportedly terrorizing villagers. And Melania also told of the spirit of a woman dressed in draping black clothes that would come out off the cliffs. Her dress was so long, she would drag it. She had a very white face and would disappear back into the cliffs. The goosebumps terror felt when people encountered these spirits was nothing compared to what happened to Melania's godfather, Andrew Kamluck. He was logging in 1931 when someone or something hit him over the head with a piece of log moving equipment. The blow reportedly killed him instantly. When the cool light of the blood moon beckons, the midnight call won't be ignored. And every creature of the night looking for love needs the right scent to snare their heartthrob. In partnership with Ruddy Man Grooming, the brothers of the Belief Hole have curated Night Stalker. A beard oil scent that blends the masculine, earthy forest aroma with the seductive notes of tobacco and vanilla for a subtly sweet balance that will have your partner purring late into the evening. However the night moves you, Night Stalker Beard Oil is your loyal companion. Yes! So head over to Beliefful.com and click on the Night Stalker button. Available in beard oil, bombs, and butters. And don't forget to use the code BELIEFHOLE for 15% off your purchase. Whoa! That's BELIEFHOLE, one word, all lowercase. Night Stalker. For a superior breed of beard. Welcome, friends. Welcome back, guys. Yes. Hope you enjoyed the break. I hope you are in the mood for some more spooky tales. Before that, though, we have a very special person to thank. Oh, yes, we do. We have a a Skywheel Rider. Skywheel Rider. Skywheel Rider. (laughs) (laughs) I still don't know what the slapping sound is in there, but I love it. That's when you're whipping it when you're riding it. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Teresa, so much. Teresa Birch. Support of the whole, and she signed up for the most generous tier, the $50 tier yes. to support the show, and so that yeah. makes her a Skywalker writer. She's awesome. Super important. And she has also bought a shirt to wear to a conference to represent. Yes, she did. This is awesome. Yeah, it's the Comic-Con and- The True Belief Warrior. Yeah, Emerald City Con, I think it is. So that's Show awesome. your love for the whole. Yeah, anyone else who wants to do that, uh, we super appreciate it as well. You can sign up when signing up for the expansion at that, at that you tier. You can be the cool friend too, like that new belief <laughs> hole when they were not that big yet still. Mm-hmm. And you can ride us to the top <laughs> like a sky whale. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, a, it's a comfortable, fun ride. That's right. Get on it. Oh, and I want to make one quick statement here. Uh, I made a mistake on the last l- a listener story and I just wanted to correct you real quick. It was a, a guy named Kiefer who sent in a story and I called it One Night at the Gas Station. It was the, if you guys remember. It was a good story. It was too. a great story. He's basically experiences someone else who's being haunted. Yeah. He turned him into a Jackie. Yeah. I changed the name on accident to Jackie because someone else had sent in a story from right, Jackie. Right. Anyway, it happened. That was Kiefer. So Kiefer, thank you for that story. It's one of my favorites this season so far. It's great. Well, what's, what's next? Next, we are getting into a specific area in California, the Redlands. <laughs> Have you heard of this place, guys? No, it sounds mysterious, though. It is, apparently. The Redlands. Yes. Apparently a very haunted, very strange goings-ons in this part of the world. And we'll get into that after we recount some tales. And I should say, when we're talking about the Redlands, there might be some things that we discuss that could be unnerving for certain listeners. Mm -hmm. If you're sensitive to uh, animal mistreatment or child snatching, Uh, none of this will be talked about in graphic detail. But in case you have the kiddos listening, maybe. yeah, these things will be mentioned. So just a heads up, listener discretion is advised. These two accounts come from Petra. This first one I call lock away your cats. This John, this one's for you. Ooh, I don't like the sound of that. I'm just going to be eating them, eating them up. I considered almost holding these back for closer to Halloween listener stories, but they were too good. Oh, we'll get more. We have plenty of spooky stories. Mentone is a small, unincorporated area next to the Redlands. 
Redlands is known for its churches and its rich. I like to describe Mentone as a place where redneck meets gangster. Lots of poor people in Mentone. Redlands also has a dark past and lots of haunted places for such a small town. There is a park where there's a south-facing pentagram of palm trees in Redlands. The grass is worn into the pentagram shape between the trees, showing it is often walked. By whom, you ask? This happened in around 94. I was 15 at the time. It was close to Halloween. Around this time of year, everyone locked up their black cats inside. That's the thing. Is it? Yeah. Well, we can elaborate after. Go ahead. I was always told to do this. At the time, I didn't know about all the dark practices that happened in the area. I was watching the neighbor's kids, two of them. They were nine and six-ish. It was a nice fall afternoon, so we decided to take my dog for a walk. They didn't have a dog, and mine was super friendly. As we were walking, we saw a white car in very good shape in a poor area, stop in the middle of the road. Two women got out, opened the trunk, and then they carried something between them and placed it in the middle of the road. They got back in the car and drove away. We stopped a distance away. I was unsure of what was in the road. I handed the leash of my dog to one of the kids and told them to wait here. I then inspected what the woman had left. It was a black and white cat. It had been gutted. It was a ritualistic looking cut. There was little to no blood. I ran back to the kids. They asked what it was. I changed the subject, said we should hurry home for dinner. The sight of that cat still haunts me. I think they were hoping the body would get run over to cover what they did to it. Every year after that, my cats were indoor cats around Halloween. I'm glad I moved from that area. I'll take Bigfoot over cults any day. I have more stories from the Redlands that I will share. I'm a skeptic about the supernatural, but there are some things I just can't explain. Me too. Yeah, yeah that's disturbing. That's very disturbing. Yeah, I don't like, like it. Why, like one thing I can't explain is how can people so be short-sighted and just vacant of all emotion? Yeah. Empathy I mean, to gut maybe, a cat. I guess if they're into the demonic, they don't have emotions like that. Well, then again, short-sightedness. We talk about all the time about the idea of people who get into well, if you're dark actually arts, using that for yeah, uh, like yeah for a no, trade, like and it's no like consequences. Yeah, right, exactly. The karmic, the karmic trade of uh, yeah. killing something for you know the purpose of gaining something. I guess we all eat meat, but yeah, we are gaining. That's but for it, vitamins. Yeah, they're trying to get like powers. Well, yeah. Yeah. vitamins. Depending on <laughs> <laughs> depending on who you are, the eating of meat is a natural process that is a give yeah, and take nothing of, to do with ritual right you like there's a when, whenever magic is applied or some kind of deal with a some it's a trade that's some the darkness thing. sex magic some, uh, yeah but it, the idea of it being a trade that's you're sacrificing not it's not it's not a relationship between you and the animal it's right. a relationship with you and this other thing just beyond our realm it's a very self-centered thing to do too yeah, yeah. oh absolutely and that's what i think makes it so dark one of the one of the things obviously but uh sorry if you're a cat a uh, sacrificer. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. We don't want to, you know, discriminate to, here. Yeah, we're not trying to, you know, piss on someone's parade, but <laughs> probably should stop doing that. Anyway, but yes, I'd never heard of this area before and the occult practices that go on there, but apparently this is not an unknown thing to in occur the Red, Redlands? in Redlands, really? California. So this is interesting. I pulled this from aboutredlands.com. Two things Redlands is known for. Citrus and paranormal activity. It is allegedly one of the most haunted towns in America from innocent spirits on swings to downright demonic apparitions. Our town has all kinds of ghastly happenings. And the specific example I grabbed here from the article was about Prospect Park, because this relates to the story. Not only was Prospect Park thought to be prime location for Satan worshippers to gather at night, but multiple murders have taken place there. In 2013, a man was arrested for assaulting and murdering a woman, and afterward, her body was discovered in the park. However, this is not the most notable Prospect crime. In the late 1960s, an 11-year-old girl named Lee Ann was walking home from Kingsbury Elementary School. She was abducted and murdered. Police later found her body under the stage. Sad. Very sad. People who claim to have ghostly encounters at Prospect Park all have reported the same thing, the sound of footsteps across the stage. And just the last corroborative thing here I have, 
is from Reddit in regards to this area and people's personal experiences. John, will you read this here under Haunted Places and Redlands? When I went to Greenspot Bridge around midnight, I noticed a figure underneath the bridge. He was collecting rocks for some sort of altar, which we would find later. After I got closer to the bridge with my flashlight, I didn't see the figure anymore, but I did hear this creepy laughing. I looked around and saw a guy in a werewolf mask pull out a pocket knife. I heard the click as he got closer to me. Fearing for my life, I ran back to my car and pulled the windows up. He didn't seem to follow as I drove back home. When I came back early in the morning, I noticed a pentagram formation with rocks and some blood in the middle. I don't know if that guy was a devil worshiper or just a crazy meth head. Meth head? Meth head. (laughs) Well, so this is a thing, huh? This is a thing. So I just wanted to bring that in because I was interested in the conversation. The guy also said in this feed that he noticed some devil worshippers in the orange groves, which which plays a key role into our next story. That's creepy. Yeah. Yeah, In the orange groves. Exactly. And then um, someone responded to that. And this kind of shows that this is a common known thing if you're from the area. Someone responded to his comment here and said, I think the amazing part here is that most of us could read that and assume it's nothing too out of the ordinary. So this is a a common thing in this area. Pack of devil worshippers in the orange groves again. Apparently it's a hot spot. I do think that there are areas in the country, in the world, where there are like pockets of people that are practicing some dark arts. taking over the planet right now, if you haven't noticed. And they're not the people just like putting up a statue at a courthouse, you know, of a goat. These are people that are hiding (laughs) underground, working in the shadows, if you will. Okay, so the last account we have from the Redlands, from Petra, relates specifically to the orange groves. Jeremy. This is called The Pool in the Orange Grove, and this takes place in Redlands, California, in 1999. I had a close friend whose family was very well off. They had several acres of land with a good-sized house. His parents were out of town for a few days, and my boyfriend and I decided we would come over and hang out. They could golden eye, and I could swim in the pool. Before this, we had never stayed at, we had never stayed the night at his house. We had fun, played some video games, talked about setting up a role-playing game. At the time, we played D&D and World of Darkness mainly. We just hung out. We didn't drink or do any drugs. We were all completely sober. Well, the sun goes down, and I decided I wanted to go for a swim. The guys weren't down, so I went by myself. I was having fun in the water, diving in sometimes, sometimes just floating about, sometimes swimming around. Then I began to feel uncomfortable, like I was being watched. I chalked it up to paranoia. I was alone in a pool that was separate from the house in the middle of an orange grove. Of course I was feeling paranoid. That's a creepy setting right there to me. A oh yeah. old pool in the middle of an orange grove at night, swimming alone, separate from the house. Yeah. I swam around for a bit, but the feeling didn't go away. I decided I was going to dive in again. I got out and jumped back in. The pool wasn't very deep, probably around 10 feet on the deep end. My toes touched the bottom like normal, and I kicked off toward the surface. Then I felt a hand grab my ankle. I kicked hard to surface fast. I then ran inside. I told my friend. He acted all casual about it. He said, The ghost usually doesn't bother people. It's a pretty good Californian. <laughs> Not bad. I was a bit freaked out at this point. I went to the half bath to change out of my swimsuit. The half bath had a mirror along the wall opposite the door. The mirror was above the sink. On either side of the sink, along the ceiling were lights, one orb light on each side. While I was changing, I looked over at the mirror. I saw a head and two hands come out of the mirror. I quickly dressed and ran out of that room. I headed into the sunroom where the guys were. The back wall of the half bath was the main wall of the sunroom. I again told my friend. He then told me about the wine cellar in the sunroom. The wine cellar in the sunroom is directly behind the half bath. When his family moved in, there was a piano in the wine cellar. They had to have it dismantled to get it out. At the time I considered myself a Wiccan, I pulled out a small stone out of my bag that I had put a protection spell on. That stone didn't leave my hand all night. I also didn't really sleep that night. I was quite happy to head home in the morning. I never went to his house without protection again. The ghost never bothered me after that. Okay, to be grabbed in a pool. Yeah. Everybody's nightmare. And especially in the dark at night. Yeah. In the, I don't know, something about being in a grove of trees too. Very eerie. Mm-hmm. 
And of course, you know, seeing someone kind of a mirror is pretty terrifying. Yeah. That reminds me of a Are You Afraid of the Dark episode that always haunted me. I think it was called like the dead float or the zombie float. Oh, yeah. This basically- Shows up in pools and pulls people down. Yeah. This like corpse thing will grab you if, when you're swimming in the pool. I, I had constant fears about that growing up. I should have asked her about that wine cellar because when she talked about the piano, there was, mm-hmm. she was kind of, a, it sounded like she was alluding to something going on in there. Anyway. Yeah. yeah interesting story. To yeah. Be thank sure. you, Petra, for that. That was pretty creepy. Yeah. If I ever go to the Redlands, I'll be sure to keep my eyes out. Stay away from orange groves. Yeah. Well, let's wrap this episode up with a nicer tale, but also kind of sweet. This story comes from Laura. This occurred at her fiancé's house in around 2011. About 10 years ago, after a very turbulent time in my life, I ended up making a new life for myself in Canada. The trials of driving cross-country and dealing with a move over international borders left me and my fiancé, at the time now husband, bone-weary. About a week after arrival, and still wiped out from the moving stress, we had fallen asleep early with the windows and fan on since the day had been very warm and had kicked the only blanket off the end of the bed. Being Canada, however, the night cooled fast and I woke up shivering. Being so tired and half asleep, instead of closing the windows and turning off the fan, I just turned on my side and curled up closer to my future husband, who was sleeping on his side facing away from me. I then went into a deep dream In this dream, I was sitting on the floor of my deceased grandmother's house, and it was pitch black, like the kind of black you experience deep in a cave when you turn the flashlight off. Around me, I could hear shuffling, but was totally unafraid, more curious than anything. As I was sitting there, I felt a familiar fabric sweep against me. I knew automatically that it was my grandmother's furry house robe that she would wear every morning, making breakfast. After that, I felt warmth come over my legs, then torso. In the dream, I calmly said, Thank you. The second I said this, I became fully and instantly awake and aware of a blanket being gently tucked around my shoulders. I instantaneously realized what I was experiencing, and an electric chill washed over me. The blanket had been unceremoniously dumped on the floor at the end of the bed, was now tucked around me. I laid very still and knew, knew if I had turned over at that moment, I would have seen my grandmother. My fiance, a very heavy sleeper, was still snoring beside me in the same position, and we were the only ones in the house. Gathering my courage, I finally turned over. Of course, nothing was there. I still profoundly felt like I had momentarily stepped outside of our universe, though. I laid in bed the rest of the night and pondered the experience, finally coming to the conclusion that it was just my grandmother letting me know that in trying times, she was still there to tuck me in at the end of the day. That's super sweet. Yeah. Super sweet, like orange fields. Nice turn for me, though, the citrus fields of terrifying Redland. Yeah. That's very nice, yeah, Laura. Thank, I'm glad you had that experience. That. I, do. I love those kinds of experiences mm-hmm. and stories. Yeah, the supernatural isn't all horrifying. A lot of times it's reassuring. It's mostly great. It's interesting. I didn't bring it in this episode, but there's a story we'll do later on that is reminiscent of this because it involves that same sort of thing of mm-hmm. someone, in, but they were in a dream, having these reoccurring dreams of visiting someone that died in a car wreck and they're in this dark, same thing, dark like a cave and then there's a spotlight with a person. Typical. First they First they get kicked out, bouncer says you can't be there. Then they go back and it's, it's a really interesting story. We'll talk about it maybe on the next listener stories episode, but definitely. Well, I look forward to the next one after these smashing stories. Yes. That was a fun one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I thought some pretty fascinating tales. Good job, Chris. You gathered some of the top stories. I think Chris the Gatherer. Thank you. <laughs> and thank our listeners because without the listeners, these would not be here yes. at all. Thank you to everyone who submitted their stories. If you haven't heard them on the show, stick around. They may be coming up and regardless, we will have them all published on our website eventually. Yes. And then as John said earlier, we'll be looking for other ways to get more stories out faster. So sometimes it just feels good to get them off your chest too, right? Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. We do read them all. And this doesn't have to be the end of your belief whole time right now. You can head on over to the expansion. Because right now, a brand new episode of Mysterious Great White North Mystery is waiting for you. Don't let it end. And it is a great story, too. Yes. And I dug deep. I got some original research in there. We've got like 60 episodes over there, plus another 30 from our first season. Mm -hmm. You've got like 200 hours of more content. Maybe not that much, but a lot. Oh, at least that much. You think? I think I think so. Because some of our first season episodes were like That's true. two, three hours. Don't waste any more time. Get over there and support the show. Because we're going to build a studio someday. And we someday. want you to be a part of it. 
We do. We want you to be fired. All we right. can have one of those things where they can buy a brick with their name in it. Ah, that's back. a good idea. Physically build the studio. Idea. That's such a good idea. Right? All right, guys. Well, on that note, we have some very special people to thank. Yes, we do. Remember, stick around for the outtakes. There's going to be some funny ones. And since we are catching up on everyone who signed up at Black Eyed Cool Kid level, $7 and up, you guys are amazing. We still have a good number, which we're going to finally wrap up today of before we change those tiers of our original $5 members that signed up that still need their name read. So you guys are getting taken care this of today. This is the backlog and we're going to do the lightning round. We have to do it lightning round style, guys. So it, it's not going to be quite as much attention to each name, but every name is going to be equally loved. Yes. Because we appreciate all of you. So and get ready. after this, we will commence with the Black Eyed Cool Kids. Black Eyed Cool Kids. We have quite a number of you too, so. Yes. We, we're getting more than we thought. So that's a good thing. Also, we love Dog you guys. Whispers and Shadow Person of mm -hmm. Interest. You guys are all coming. Don't forget. Yes. All right, you old school expansion members. Here we go. Thank you to... Thank you to Harold Plog or Ploeg. We love you. Uh, Karen. Hi, Karen. We love you. Great to see you here. Uh, sorry, I was used to that. <laughs> Sarah <laughs> Hennessy, welcome. Ooh, yes. drinking you up. Ooh. Tyler Shug. Yes. Oh, shug me off. No. <laughs> nope. Not going to do that. <laughs> what? Benji Thompson is here. All right. Find your way home, Benji. You're here in the hole. Woo, woo. Welcome no. to be here. Uh, Lindy Whack. Lindy Whack and Mole. Yes. Whack a Whack. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> Sarah Shively. Ooh. Welcome. Thank you, and Welcome. Thank you to Ken Mullins. Yes, yes Ken. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Vady Jewel. Vady Jewel, we'd love to have you in here. Thank you. A prize gem. Ernie Powers is here, guys. Oh, so much power with Ernie. Yes. <laughs> Chelsea has also arrived deep in the hole. Thank Ooh. you. Welcome into the hole, Chelsea. We love you. Nelly yes. is here. Nelly yes. Furtado. Yes. Yes, that's the one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Probably not. It's a good horse. Abby name. Bernard, welcome to the hole. Abby Bernard, I love you, miss you. Mm. Hope you're doing well. Love Old you, friend. miss you. Uh, Austin Strode. I used to live in Austin. Thank yes. you for being here, Austin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Austin, Texas. Uh, Greg B is here. Welcome. Mm, buzz yes. Buzz, my friend is yes. here. Greg B. Yes. Julia, what? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, Julia Abercrombie. Oh my God. Yes. Where, did you work there, John? <laughs> yes. No. No, he was going to be a yes. model for that. He wanted to model. <laughs> he used to was. like it. There's that short modeling thing Back he tried. In, I'm talking about high school. Go. Okay. MKT. All right. Look MKT. At the, in the yes. house. Welcome to the hole. Thank yes. you so much for your support. Welcome to be here. Tyler Doty. Mm. Tyler Doty. Yes. I love yes. that name. That's a familiar name. Yes. Welcome to the hole. Welcome. Yes. And Campfire. Tales of the Strange and Unsettling. It's a podcast. Oh. Is that Jordan's podcast? Check it out. Check it out. Oh, definitely check that uh, out. Link in the show notes, guys. Um, thank you for, for your support, my Appreciate friend. Appreciate it. Linda Rodas. Yes. Welcome to be here, Linda. You've taken the right road. You're in the hole. Leanne Deal. Leanne landed a deal. God, what a steal to get Leanne, yeah. uh, Leanne, Leanne Deal. Deal Thank in the you hole. for being here. Great to and have I love you. you. Me too. <laughs> Bracken Trudeau is here. Welcome. Well, Welcome. We're not related to the dictator. <laughs> Probably not. Yes. Uh, Jess Mears is here. Yes. Hey, Jess. Thank you for being here. We love you. Great to see Jess you. Jess Mears. Thank Welcome. you so much. Kevin Kelly. Kevin Kelly, get out of here. Welcome to the show. I mean, get over here. Stay here forever. <laughs> forever. John Kinzel is here. Thank you so much, John Kinzel. John Kinzel, you are the man. Yes. Yes. Denise yes. Fly N. Denise Flyin'. Denise oh, was you know flying. what? I think it's a typo. I think it's Denise Flynn, perhaps. Mm. In any case. Either way. Either Denise, way. Flown into our hearts. You are welcome <laughs> to be here. Yes, thank you so much, Denise. Kellen Gray Pants is here. Welcome. Oh, what? Jeremy's wearing gray pants right now. Gray pants. Synchronicity. Is he the up. gray man? I hope not. Be terrifying. Welcome in, Kellen. Uh, Lane de Jonge. It sounds like a mustard. Yes. Is that a mustard? Lane could be Lane de Jong or, or yes. Jongy. I'm not sure. Welcome to be Welcome. here. Welcome to be here, sir. Very glad to have you. Yes. Assuming that's a man. We'll find out. <laughs> we get an email. Logan Boyle. Logan. Welcome to the show. He never spoils. <laughs> Logan Boyle. Keep him refrigerator or not. He's all good. Um, <laughs> Nolan yes. Gugino. Oh, beautiful or name. Gugino. Gugino. Welcome in. Probably beautiful. not right, but no. we do appreciate your patronage. Yes, thank you so much. We have a lot of French expansion members, by the way. I just found that out. That's true. Oh, Cave sacre bleu. Yes. Well. <laughs> Caleb Munalem. Yes. Welcome. Welcome to be here. Welcome. Thank you so much for your Kalen? support. Kalen? 
Ka- Kayla. Kayla, I love that name. You're so pretty. Beautiful. <laughs> you're, you're so pretty. I can't see you. I can tell you're pretty. Yes, most Kaylas are. Not yes. that it matters. Stacy's here. Matter. Stacy, yes. you are also gorgeous. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're all going to be gorgeous from here on out. We have pictures of everyone. <laughs> Stacy, you are just one awesome person. Welcome to be here. Megan Hilliard is here. All right. Megan, you are one foxy lady. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we are getting all <laughs> creepy getting now. A little weird. <laughs> Cullen. Cullen, welcome. Oh, cool yes. Either way, we love you. Cullen's Cullen the Herd. <laughs> Finally. Oh, dark. And finally, the final member. Well, we've wrapped up the $5. Hurry up, because it's going to die. Our first Black Eyed Cool Kid official, Celtic Thor, is here. All right. Woo! Send those lightning bolts in. Celtic we Thor. are ready Celtic to be set Thor. afire. Celtic Thor. Yes. You will go far in life. Celtic. Welcome to be so here. that was the first $7 uh, dollar Cool Kid. Nice. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's awesome. Fantastic. Yes. Love you guys. Yes. You're all beautiful. Yeah. Appreciate everyone who's here. the most beautiful audience in the world. We do. We that's do. very true. Oh, yeah, special hi to Abby Bernard. You just kind of rolled over that Abby one, Bernard. but yeah, I used to work with her. That's true. Great gal. Yeah, hi, she got Abby. rolled over in our lightning round, but um, thank you guys, everyone who who is here supporting. If you're listening to the show and you're not a member yet, um, thanks for sticking through the, the thank yous. Yes. Well, we hope you guys liked this edition of Strange Listener Stories. It was great. I had a great time. Yes. Oh, and by the way, if any of you guys are hanging out on Reddit, a friend and listener of the show, Jay, has took it upon himself to start a subreddit, I believe the kids call it. For Belief Hole. Yeah, thank you, man. Awesome of you to do that. Uh, so that link will be in the show notes, guys. Check that out. And uh, by the way, thank you to everyone who's left reviews. That really is helping us because we, we have to compete, obviously, with the companies putting out all kinds of shows and just pumping out the genre-specific, paranormal, yada, yada. Yeah, we're independent. So if you love the show and you like what we do, leave reviews, spread the word, and thank you so much for being here and helping us grow. It really means everything to us. Darn tootin'. All right, guys. We'll see you at the expansion where Jeremy's going to break down some fantastic Great White Mysteries. Great White? Like the shark? Great White North? There you go. The Great White North and the mysteries they're in. It's going to be great. Alaska is a place of mystery. And we're about Mysteries. To, we're about to explore that. Um, so check it out, guys. It's out now if you're listening to this now. So. Phenomena. Thank you, everyone that's here. And we love you. And we will see you next time on, on Believe. The Belief Hole. It's just is Belief it just, Hole. It's not the, yeah. no it's, the? There's no the. Okay. On, on Belief Hole. hole. Get it. Don't you get it? So this story comes to us from Tavis, and this occurred in Indiana in 1991. I call this Dog Monster in the Road. <laughs> not super original. <laughs> not the best title. <laughs> They get better throughout. That's terrible. Dog monster on a roadside. They get better moving forward. Dog monster on the sidewalk. (laughs) You need something like, it looked at me in the eyes. You're such a wordsmith, too. I know. I was was just trying to get these in here. The other ones have better titles, but Uh sorry, Tavis. These got to be like more action-based, like, uh, and it stood up on its back legs. Yeah, but that's that's not descriptive. Well, well, let's just keep that dumb one now because we made a big deal about it. (laughs) Okay. All right. Dog monster in the road. All right. Here we go. It looks like a decrepit being. Yeah, we have a picture in the show notes, guys. We'll put well, I haven't even started talking about it. That's a specific thing coming up. Oh, okay. Well, what John is referring to three sentences. We'll be in the show notes. Sorry, sorry. We're just real excited to be back. I'm sorry, guys, if we're a okay. little over the place. But we do have some great stories. Scattered. So keep going. <laughs> are you of what? What, what, are you having, what are you having a picture of? <laughs> oh, the, your picture in the show notes. You had right there, the hyena and the short legs. Yeah. You were just talking about it. Oh, no, that's coming up here. That's what? the specific caught creature. Okay, okay. I was well, trying to get like to a you. hyena to me. We'll though. put it's pictures of hyenas in the show notes so you know Shunko what we're talking about. Shunko Keen. Is that not a Shunko Walrakeen? Okay, Keen? well, you'll hear. Okay. <laughs> We've Sorry, gotten Chris. to this specific. <laughs> i got to give my diatribe. This is a specific thing. <laughs> that's great. No, Chris, I'm appreciating the, the history and, and the, the background and all this, so please continue. I mean, it's fine to comment about, Jer. It's just we haven't gotten to it yet. Yeah, but you were talking about the legs, and the, I saw pictures of Oh, what no, you were talking I was about. talking about the description from the Native Americans. Okay. People are getting ready to pull their hair well, out this right won't now. Be in there. We'll cut that a little bit out. Hope you don't take. All right, we'll be back after this message from our sponsors. 
not. We don't have any. Beep pop boop pop. Beep pop boop Beep pop boop pop pop. Beep boop beep boop pop. Boop boop pop pop beep pop beep pop. Beep pop boop pop beep pop pop. Beep pop beep pop beep pop. Beep pop boop pop pop. Motorcycle pass. Okay. We're sorry. You've reached the wrong number. The show has gone off the rails.